coming at you from the Hey Yo Studios. It's the Fade Route with DNZ. Here are your hosts, D and Z. Coming at you live from the AO studio. AO. It's the Fade Route with D and Z. I am D. We got a great show for you tonight. The Dodgers get there, man. Again? Again. Uh, the Ravens thump the 49ers. And we do something a little different for our option this week. We have the in route roundtable. We'll begin to with today's show. With breaking news out of Denver, Russell Wilson is being benched for the remainder of the season in favor of Jarrett Stidham. Russ has thrown for over 3,000 yards and 26 touchdowns this season against only eight picks, and the team is in the midst of a playoff hunt. The move is designed to avoid triggering a clause that would pay Russ an additional $37 million if he can't pass a physical March 1st. Z, is this a shrewd business move or a big mistake by Denver? Both. Both oh, can be true. Oh, it's a cop out. Oh, both can be true simultaneously. Oh. Now, when you're looking at this, uh-huh. in a career, Mr. Stidham, he has 926 career yards, six touchdowns, seven picks. That, that's what Jared Stidham is. Now, this year, Ross is having a fantastic year. Statistically, he's having a great year. Record aside, right, seven and eight, that ass whooping by the Dolphins, right, is the most memorable, where the Dolphins hung 70 on the Broncos. And really, what the hell could Russ do about that? He's not matching them touchdown for touchdown. No one could on that day. Not even Dan Marino, John Elway, none of them. None of them. So, in 15 games this year, he's at 66% passing. Still good. Pretty damn good. 3,070 yards, 26 touchdowns, 8 picks. Now, he has been oil and water with Sean Payton pretty much since the day that Sean Payton was hired. All the way back to when Coach was trying to get Russ's people out of the building. His personal coaches, his hangers-on, the office that Russ had. Basically, Sean Payton came in, and I, I don't know if this was at the request of ownership. I don't know that. I don't know if this was a a bigger picture situation, but he systematically took down everything that Russ built in that year that Nathaniel Hackett was head coach, kind of to establish that I'm the man here, not you. You work for me. And it was rocky. It did have its ups as well. But at the end of the day, the money, it doesn't equate with what he's getting, right? You're getting seven and eight. Bill Parcells famously said, you are what your record says you are. And as good as Russ has been, his average passing yards per game is 25th in the league, right? The average points for for the Broncos is 16th in the league. It's exactly half. That's exactly the halfway point of the league. Yeah, they're hanging on. And it's a shrewd business move to get rid of him. But what is the alternative? I don't know. Because this team, with the players they have on defense, with Sutton, with Judy, with Javante Williams, they have talent. You would figure you, you build a year under Russ, you run it back, you might be on to something. Now, report the report continues to come out about how Russ was approached to restructure his contract to remove those injury designations, mm. and Russ refused. Mm. And now Russ believes he's going to get cut in March. 
And I'm sure there are plenty of teams that are going to line up to talk to Russell Wilson. The mm-hmm. Giants, the Bears, the Raiders. Just three off the top of my head. Like, they absolutely could. You know, maybe a little humble pie. Maybe he goes and talks to the Seahawks. Maybe there's, maybe this is a little bit of crow that needed to be served. But at the end of the day, the Broncos are making this move to save money, right? But Pennywise pound foolish. This may end up being disastrous in the long run. In the short run, they're punting on the season. As a fan and as a player, I'm pissed off about that. Like, we're knocking on the doorstep here. You're saying that we can't jump the Raiders? Is that what you're saying? With two games left in the season, we can't jump the Raiders? Get the fuck out of here with that. Right. As a fan, I'm rightful, I would be rightfully pissed in the direction that they're going because like, I've seen Jared Stidham. I've seen that. Wasn't impressed. He's okay. Russ is cooking. Finally. He's finally doing what you asked of him. He's finally doing it. And you're pulling the rug out from under him. So it's both simultaneously. You're gonna it's penny wise and it's pound foolish and it's gonna bite the Broncos in the ass. Yeah, I mean to me, I, I know you're saying there's a chance for them to make the playoffs, but I think there's a really small percent. I think there's a 12% chance if they win their current percentage is 12 is 7%. And if they lose, it'll go down by 1%. I mean, listen, they got to jump a lot of teams, right? It's not just the Raiders. I mean, they've got to jump the Steelers, the Bengals, the Texans. Like there's a lot of teams that are in the fight for that eighth spot. We'll um, take them one by one in a second, but go ahead. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll take care of those one by one but go ahead but my whole thing is is like listen i think we could all go back to the last year's shows where i kind of pretty much said that you know the the broncos were going to move on from russell wilson at some point i actually thought that this year we would find out a lot about russ wilson i think we would find out that he he wasn't a starting quarterback anymore that he wasn't capable of leading a team and winning on a team and I can be the first person to say that I was wrong I was dead wrong because he's had a really good year um the problem Z is that the dollar amount they're paying him does not equate to the performance that they're getting on the field and granted this is only one year this is the first year in Sean Payton's system but when you look at a team like the Browns and Joe Flacco, you're like, well, I mean, yeah, we could pay a guy a bag of beans and and be able to be the fifth seed in the AFC, especially with the talent they have. And they started dumping players early on. They dumped a lot of defensive guys. Randy Gregory comes to mind. Uh, I believe uh, there was another uh, Frank Frank uh, Frank, Frank Clark. Clark. Frank yep. Clark, another guy that they dumped. So, you know, I just, I think there's a realization coming into play where, okay, well, you know, our chances of making the playoffs are slim. Jared Siddham is a capable quarterback. And, you you know, you said his numbers before, but he was also playing for the Patriots then. Man. And they, they really didn't, they, their system doesn't really work for anybody but Tom Brady. So I'm not going to, and, and uh, Jared, Jimmy Garoppolo. So I'm not going to really hold him to what he did with, the Patriots, but I think he had some success when he was a Raider and there was a little bit of a fight for him in the offseason because he's talent. He is talent. He could rip the ball. He doesn't get hurt. There's more upside with him than there is with Russell Wilson at this point. So uh, to their fan base, it's just like, hey, you know, we thought we were going to compete at a high level. We kind of did because, you know, despite everything, we're around 500. We're third in the AFC West. And I don't think really turning to Jared Sidham is punting on the season. I think it's we're trying to we're trying to prepare ourselves for next year, but also trying to be competitive this year. So, you know, I, I think 
I think I do not think he will be a Bronco next year. There was a line of teams interested in him last offseason. I'm sure he'll get another job, but his per- it's his personality too. He's you know, there are reports that he isn't the he isn't a very team friendly guy. Like he's he's in his own world. Um and that's okay. And that's okay. So I, I'm I'm okay with them doing this. Um, I think it's a shrewd business move. I do not think it's a big mistake by Denver. Denver ain't winning the championship. They ain't coming out of the AFC. You know, it's time to be realistic about certain things. Like the Steelers. Come on. It's not happening. Bengals. Not happening. Like, guys, they're, it's not happening. So, I'm okay with it. Well, let's take those guys one by one. All right. Now, I'm going to include the Jaguars here. Because without Trevor Lawrence, that ship be sinking. Hey, man, C.J. Beathard is the real deal, man. Oh, my God. C.J. Beathard is a scrubino. He's just good enough to get you beat. Come on. Ah, you oh. like that. You like that. He's just good enough to get you beat. So here's what I see. In the next two weeks, I see the Jags and Colts flipping positions. Right? Colts move to four. Jags move to seven. Bills and Browns are kind of staying where they are. Bills draw the Jets. Uh, Bills draw the Patriots. Browns draw the Jets on Thursday. So that leaves you with Jags. Without Trevor Lawrence, I'm not impressed. Texans without C.J. Stroud, I'm not impressed. Bengals without Joe Burrow, I'm not impressed. Steelers with whoever the fuck is under center, it doesn't matter. You take a number, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Their offense sucks, and that leaves you with the Raiders. The Raiders who. Show a lot of fight. Show a lot of heart. They knocked off the, Ra- the, the the Chiefs, the reigning champions, in Arrowhead on Christmas Day. That's a big one. Antonio Pierce is coaching for his job. And they still haven't given him said job, so he's going to keep coaching. So it's within the wrong possibility that week 18, you could have Broncos, Raiders, and the winner of that game decides the playoff spot it's within the possibility and if I'm a Bronco fan I'm looking at that idea and it's like <sighs> I had an opportunity here I had a legitimate opportunity and the team took it away from me by punting on the season so I don't know I think it's just a little short sighted Yes, the money is an issue. There are way there are ways to do this. There are certainly ways to do this, and I think the Denver Broncos shows poorly in this instance. But speaking about choosing poorly, it was a poor choice Christmas night. For the Niners to even show up against the Ravens. Don't look now, but the Baltimore Ravens announced their candidacy for the top spot in the NFL. Not just the AFC, the NFL. With a convincing 33-19 beatdown. It was an ass whooping over the Niners on the road in Santa Clara. Lamar Jackson threw for 252 uh, yards, two touchdowns. While the defense made Brock Purdy look irrelevant forcing him into four picks. Knocking him out of the game with a stinger. Sam Darnold comes in, throws a touchdown, but then he gets picked off too. You're the Ravens fan here. You're the resident Ravens fan. Is Baltimore officially the team to beat in all of the NFL? Hmm. Wow, that's a bold one. Um, I don't want to be arrogant and say that. Uh, because I do think there is a lot of competition in the AFC, uh, it's going to be hard to get there. They're going to be battle tested before they get to the Super Bowl. Because <clears throat> um, I'm not going to discount the Chiefs, even though they lost to the Raiders, because they're the champs. To be the man, you got to beat the man. So I really like the Browns. I think the Browns have a lot of talent on defense, and the way they've been able to win football games this year is is incredible. Uh, I wouldn't discount Buffalo. Buffalo is a good team too. So, no, I'm not going to say that. Um, but what I will say is, 
this game was closer than it ended. Like, yeah, they picked him off three times, but they still only scored. They still only won by two touchdowns. So, I mean, yeah, there was there was five total interceptions they had, and three of them I think really came in the first half, and then they knocked him out of the game. The Ravens have actually the Ravens defense has actually knocked a lot of a lot of quarterbacks out this year. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to say it really came down to halftime adjustments because Baltimore came out and scored 17 points in the third quarter. And 49ers didn't score anything. Um, it was a welcome to the varsity moment, I feel like. Um, there was a lot riding on this game for Brock. Brock was seeking, you know, really to become the MVP. I think a win in this game would have made Brock Purdy the MVP. Um Christian McCaffrey too had a lot riding on this game and he played well. You know, they didn't have a he had a hundred he had a hundred yards and a touchdown. So they didn't have a lot of answers for him. I was pedestrian. You know, the biggest thing was is the the, the, Ra- the Ravens didn't turn over the football. And when you think about it, I mean the the, the 49ers turned over the ball five times mm-hmm. and they only lost by two touchdowns. Uh, they're they're a good football team. I'm not gonna shut I'm not gonna shoot them down. I think we got to also remember that Brock Purdy was Mr. Irrelevant for a reason, man. For a reason. I saw Debo Samuel take a shot from Marlon Humphrey like it was nothing. Like it was like Marvin, Marlon Humphrey hit a brick wall and he just kept going. This team is talented. And you give, if they were to meet in the Super Bowl and you give them two weeks to prepare for this game, it's a different game. So, no. I'm not ready to crown the Ravens. I think it's going to be a. I think they've got to go through the AFC, which you know they have a habit of collapsing in in, in playoff games, and then they're going to have to beat the best the NFC has. So, I think uh, I think they're not officially a team to beat, but this was a big game for the Ravens. It was a big game. I think that this weekend is going to be even bigger because they draw the Dolphins. It's number one versus number two. In Miami. In Miami. But this has so, a chance to be a letdown game. You know, you get really up for... For both sides because yeah. Miami's had the Cowboys. Sure, right. And the whole thing is, is like, you know, the Ravens felt disrespected because they were a five-point dog, you know, in the 49er game. They came in and slapped them. You know, and then, you know, outside of Trent Williams, the offensive line isn't really that great for the 49ers. So, it, it was a good game. It was a good game. And I think it, it just, it will help the Ravens keep moving in the right direction. Yeah, definitely. Um, it is a little bit disconcerting when you look deeper into the numbers, right? The Ravens' passing attack is only 21st in the league. Their run game is number one, but a lot of that has to do with Lamar. Lamar is your leading rusher again. 142 carries, 786 yards, five touchdowns. Now, of course, that's due to Dobbins being hurt and then Mitchell getting hurt. But can we just talk about Gus Edwards for a second and Justice Hill and how these guys keep getting disrespected? Mm -hmm. Like Gus Edwards, how many times does Gus Edwards need to prove that he is a good back in this league. Mm. He always seems like, oh, we're going to pencil him in as a third string back. Gus Edwards has the potential to be a bell cow, and he's demonstrated that multiple times. He's bailed the Ravens out so many times. I've lost count. Yeah, he appreciates you. I don't know if I see it the same way. He's like a Jamal Williams. Look at Jamal Williams the year he had last year, and he ain't doing shit this year. Well, Jamal Williams is also running with Alvin Kamara. Mm -hmm. It's a big difference between, you know, being the lead guy, right? Or being compliment to a quarterback and complimenting Alvin Kamara. It's a big difference. So, Gus Edwards is a very solid back. Justice Hill is a good handcuff for him. They need to, in the last two weeks, they need to establish that. Because what do we always say about the quarterback being the leading rusher on your team? It's a recipe for disaster. So if they can establish a rhythm and if they can take that out of Lamar's game to some extent, I'm not saying entirely, but it shouldn't be it shouldn't be one of the features, we'll say. 
Lamar can focus on the passing game and he can be effective. Now, the other thing that Lamar needs to do, continue to do as the year ends out and you're going to go in the playoffs, you need to figure out who you can trust in terms of who is your best receiver. That was Mark Andrews. He's not there. So who's it going to be? Is it Isaiah Likely? Is it Zay Flowers? Is it Odell Beckham? Is it Bateman? Right? You have plenty of people. You have plenty of talk. The Ravens have a plethora of good wideouts. It's it's amazing to me. So that's what I need to see in the last two weeks of the season. I need to see that chemistry develop, and I need to see that offense really start to come into better shape and into better form. The defense is there. The defense is going to play. The defense is going to beat you up. That's what they do. The Baltimore Ravens are smash mouth. They're, I mean, they're purple for a reason, right? They leave you black and blue. Like, that, that's the part of it. Now, they draw Miami this week. That's a tough game. And then, week 18, possibly with nothing to play for, against the Steelers. So you're closing out against the Steelers. The Steelers have pride. They're going to play that game hard. They're going to play that game tough. So... I really want to see what they've got. But as of right now, you know, officially, I, I got to say that they are the team to beat, right? The Niners were that team. The Ravens knocked them off. So now they're at the top of that perch. Who They're king of the mountain right now. That's all the regular season is. It's a game of king of the mountain. Who can come and knock me off? And no one has been able to stay up there for very long. So maybe the Ravens are the last man standing. Maybe they will be. Time will tell. Do you love brownies? Of course you love brownies. But you know what's better than a brownie? A delicious, handcrafted, gourmet brownie delivered right to your doorstep. That's what our guys at Sweet Life Brownie Co. offer. Chef Tommy D and the crew offer a dozen delicious delights that you will crave from the classic OB to Dutch Apple to Campfire S'mores and many more. Check out their website, sweetlifebrownieco.com for their Friday brownie drops. At noon, their site goes live and you see what they're making. Since you're there, become a site member and earn points. You earn 50 points just by signing up. Make sure you follow them on Instagram and Facebook too at sweetlifebrownie underscore co for the latest updates and their latest releases and creations. That's sweetlifebrownieco.com. Give them a call, 845-641-3043, and tell them D&Z sent you. That's sweetlifebrownieco.com, 845-641-3043. Sweet Life Brownie Co., because there's always room for a brownie. Speaking of time, oh boy, another day and another record contract given out by the Dodgers. LA Inc. Japanese star Yoshinobu Yamamoto to a 12-year contract worth $325 million despite never throwing a pitch in the major leagues. So the plan is to pair Yamamoto with the newly extended Tyler Glass now, possibly with the returning Dustin May, possibly with the returning Tony Gonsolin, and flesh out that rotation for a season. And then you add in the Kingfish, you add in Shohei Otani into the mix, moving forward. Are the Dodgers setting themselves up for a huge success or a huge disappointment down the road? I think it's I think I think it's a success. Um, you know, they've just they've gotten the right players. I always feel nervous though when you're dealing with the Rays. You know, you gotta be careful working with those guys. Yeah, they usually know when something's coming. Um, yeah, I mean, I believe in Otani. Uh, I've seen Yamamoto pitch, and he looks nasty. Um, and that's the one area where we're just not sure if the Dodgers are going to compete at a high level, right? We're not sure about the pitching. Um, we're not sure what's going to go on with Kershaw. We're not sure what Bueller's going to look like. Glass now is coming over. 
Otani's not pitching this year, and then you have Yama, Yamamoto. Um, so, much like the Phillies did, you bang the baseball, you're giving yourself a big chance to win. I can see this team averaging between six and eight runs a game. Uh, so, I think I think they're going to be fine. I mean, they have a ton of money. They have a ton of investors. This is their time. The Dodgers are basically the, the late 90s, early 2000s Yankees. They're just buying players. They're just, they're go, they're all in. And if you're going to beat them, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be like a lazy, a lazy pop fly over the infield that you just happen to hit in game seven of the World Series or game seven of, uh, of the, of the playoff series you're with, you're in them. You know, unless you're a young, hot team that comes in and just beats them in five games or six games, because they're just they're just building themselves for success. <clears throat> I mean, we'll see. Like, we're we're definitely gonna look and see. Like, they certainly pay a lot of guys to do that. They they pay a lot of guys big money. Yeah, and you um, can't and you definitely can't buy championships anymore in baseball. I believe in that. I believe there was an era where you could buy championships in baseball, but I don't think that exists now because everybody spends money. It's just that they're spending a lot of money and they're spending it in the right places. Uh, and that's what you just kind of look at like, ah, oh, man, like I got to pitch the bets, Otani and Freeman, man. And if you look at like this pitching staff, it's like, okay, it's going to be Glass now, Yamamoto, possibly Bueller. You know, it's like, uh, you know, they've got a chance. Hey, I'm, I'm a little concerned. You know, it does, there is a steep drop off after those guys. Right? You have Betts. Okay. You have Otani. Great. You have Freeman. And even Max Muncy. Right? And then after that, who you got? James Altman. Watch out for big game James, man. Miguel Rojas. Will Smith. Will Smith. Hey, back-to-back champion. Yes, back-to-back champion. Yes. No, not that Will Smith. The catcher (laughs) Will Smith. Oh, I like Will Smith. Not to be the Will Smith. I, I like him. He's a good catcher. He's probably he is a good catcher. He's a Austin good catcher. Barnes, solid catcher. But I don't fear him. I don't fear Chris Taylor. I don't fear Utility anybody. man. Utility man. Yeah, Chris Taylor utility helped man. me win a fantasy championship. I like that guy. Utility man, but I don't fear him. I fear those other guys, right? They had J.D. Martinez. Like, he's a free agent. He's a free agent. You could possibly bring him back. Bring him Cody back. Bellinger's There's a, lot a free of agent. Free, yeah, it's a lot of good free agents. Cody out Bellinger's there. out there. They need more. Like, I'm not scared of that lineup past number three in the order. I, I'm not scared. But Yamamoto, I'm definitely interested in this. I, I want to see how it plays. Career 75 and 30. A 172 ERA. He's struck out 986 batters in 967 and two-thirds innings and has only walked 216. Has only given up 36 career home runs. Right? And he's been pitching. He's a pro for six years. He's, he's 24. He's been a pro since he was 18. So, like, he's got... He's got years under his belt. Like, much in the same way that Victor Wembanyama had years under his belt, even though he's only 19 years old. Right? The years of pro experience in France. Yamamoto has years of pro experience in Japan. Now, what's he facing in terms of offense? Right? Japanese hitters are good to decent. You have American imports who are still who are trying to find themselves right in most cases like they're going over there to try and rebuild their worth so they can come back to the major leagues so what's he really facing I fully expect that earn run average to tick up closer to three just because he's facing better competition (coughs) I firmly expect those walk totals to go up because he's got to get used to the American mound, the American ball, the American rotation. It's not a six-man rotation. It's not pitching every Saturday or every Friday. You're pitching whenever your turn comes around. And it takes a while to get used to those things, right? Masahiro Tanaka, we saw it here in New York. 
but he, it took him a while to get used to it. And he pitched to, to decent success. He was, playoff Tanaka was a real thing. He was better in the playoffs than he was in the regular season, but Masahiro Tanaka was very good once he figured out what to do and how to change his game to adapt it to playing in Major League Baseball. I firmly expect Yamamoto to do that. He's, I, I doubt he's going to be as dominant as he was in Japan. But I'm still looking at this roster. I'm still looking at this team. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not impressed with a lot of it. I'm not impressed with a lot of it. You have a lot of splash. You have a lot of big names. You have a lot of money thrown around. And then once you get past that, you know, like maybe Bobby Miller will be good. We'll see. You know, Bobby Miller was okay last year. We'll see. Can Dustin May fully come back ever? We'll see. What's Emmett Sheehan? What's Gavin Stone? They're very front-loaded and then you're relying on a bunch of guys that we still know about. Prospects are prospects for a reason. They're question marks. They're absolute question marks until they they get to the bigs. But I think long term, it's going to be a disappointment. It's going to end up being a disappointment. 12 years, that's going to be age 36. Right? What's Shohei Otani at that point? Is Freeman still there? Is Mookie Betts still there? What does this team look like at the end of this term? What does this team look like at the end of the contract? Because that's when the balloon payments are going to start for for Otani. They might have just put themselves into a financial quagmire that they may have difficulty getting out of. So... Other teams are going to spend, and other, like you said, like other teams are doing that. They're they're not shy of playing with the big boys anymore, thanks to TV contracts. They're getting this cash and they're using it. And I think that short term, sure, there's going to be a success. Is there going to be a World Series? I'm not seeing it. But I think as we get further and further down the road and that balloon payment starts coming, as that balloon payment becomes closer and closer, it's going to bite them in the ass. Avoid messy accidents. Get better stopping power with your brake pads. Callahan brake pads. You never know when you'll be driving in the road and there will be a truck tire that you need to avoid and save your family. Callahan Auto, we really care about what's under your hood. It's the in route where friends of the show get a special segment with us. Want to be part of the action? Want to be the newest member of the in crowd? You know what to do. Hit us up, faderoutmail at gmail.com or slide in those DMs on Fade Route Podcast on IG or hit that Twitter, Fade Route DNZ. Welcome, everybody, to a special edition of the In Route. We have two members of the in crowd joining us today and we are going to do a little bit of a year in recap the good the bad stuff in between joining us today we have coach regional commissioner of asne ayazo and the current leader in the option pickup the lovely Rita Sanchez. How are we doing today? Hello, guys. Thank you for having me on. We have joining us once again, Coach Clinton D'Souza. How are you doing, Clinton? Great. Thanks for having me. 
All right, and D is joining us as always. Yes, from his luscious estate. From the palatial estate <laughs> of Casa del Dio. So let's begin as we go from the end of 2023. Let's put a little bit of a bow on things. We're going to go around the table here. Who is your athlete of the year? What is your criteria for determining the athlete of the year? So we'll start off with, how about D? Who is your athlete of the year? Yeah, so for me, it's uh, it's a slam dunk. I mean, it's, it's Shohei Otani, the $700 million man. He pitches, he hits, he does it all. As far as what goes into Athlete of the Year, it's got to be a showstopper, Undoubted, undoubtedly the leader of his team, and, uh, and a magnificent player. And this guy was probably the best pitcher on his team, the best hitter on his team. Uh, he landed the Hughes contract with the Dodgers, decided to backload the contract to allow the Dodgers to sign and and get good players around him as if he doesn't have enough good players around him. He can throw, he hits bombs, he's exciting to watch. It's hard. He's the modern day Babe Ruth for us. I know a lot of people, you know, dislike him and kind of throw him shade, but they, this, this, the stats don't lie. He is the truth. Well, is it so much that they dislike him, or is it they just dislike the media coverage of him? Like, which one do you think is more accurate? I, you know, I think a lot of people feel threatened by him. Like, I feel like Yankee fans get upset when he's compared to Babe Ruth. And and I think, uh, you know, there are some people that say, well, you know, he he's not that great of a pitcher. It's like, well, no, he, he kind of really is. And it's like, well, you know, he... He uh, he's not that great of a hitter. No, he's he's pretty great, you know. And then you you compare him to like you know a lot of people say, well, I'd rather have him than Aaron Judge, or some people say I'd rather have Aaron Judge than him, and, and it gets into that kind of heated debate where it's not it's not a, like a Ken Griffey Jr. where everybody loved Ken Griffey Jr. or it's mm-hmm. not like a um, you know it's it's not like a beloved player that everybody just like loved watching and loved being around. It's just you know this guy that. You know, for some, for whatever reason, it's the agitation. But I get what you're saying. It could be the media's coverage of him too. But for the most part, I just I think people get up get upset with the comparisons, and mm-hmm. they have a bone to pick with him possibly becoming one of the best players of the next of this of this decade. Really, I think it's fair. I mean, the hype train is definitely big, but he has been backing it up to some degree. We're definitely going to see what's going to come in the future so uh we're gonna swing on over to rita what are your criteria and who is your athlete of the year so i also agree like somebody who can kind of lead their team and make their team better um and they have their individual accomplishments but those accomplishments affect the team as a whole um so i had two who I kind of, um, I looked up their stats and compared them, and my two picks are going to be Tua and Lamar. Wow. Um, they, I, I usually, I, I really debated about this, but I thought um, their pass completion is similar, their TD is similar, interception similar, and also their supporting cast, kind of like a Motley Crue, no real like superstars around them maybe with the exception of Tyree Kill but um I kind of thought they both did well both for themselves and for their teams this year and both overcame some adversity with like injuries and for both of them I would kind of there's like a lot of hope for like 2024 so I feel like um I like them both for this year and going into next year so those are my two picks did you write one of those down while you were watching the ravens stomp out the 49ers (laughs) i was busy feeling sorry for the 49ers (laughs) so i did not but it really you know like i have to say it's been very enjoyable 
Well, I am not a Ravens fan. I am not a Dolphins fan, but I have enjoyed watching both teams this year, even playing against my teams. Hmm. So kudos to them. I mean, it's, it's hard to argue. They, they definitely are doing a lot with less. I mean, Tua has a little bit more than Lamar, especially considering that Mark Andrews has been out for this point in time. So it, uh, it definitely, you know, it, it definitely makes a lot of sense. And why not? And they, they've been putting up really good numbers. So why not? All right. Clint, we're going to come to you next. What are your criteria and who is your athlete of the year? Um, so my criteria, you know, very similar to what Rita and Dee said, um, but also I think needs to be transformational, um, needs to kind of set a standard or a bar that everyone kind of tries to uh, stride for. Um, so I'm going to go with Lionel Messi. Um, mm, you know, nice. to me... And it's only because of my own personal experience of being an elementary principal and being in a soccer clinic this week with my daughter. Every kid at that clinic and every kid in my building wears Messi jerseys. Like he has, ever since he came to Inter uh, Inter Miami, he has transformed kind of the focus. He's always been a huge star. I'm a huge Cristiano Ronaldo fan, so it actually kind of pains mm. me to say being Messi is the athlete of the year. But I think his transition to MLS um, and bringing so many eyeballs, I mean, that was the hottest ticket in town when, when the regular season was going on. I mean, he went on this streak of scoring every, every game, um, and he really kind of heightened the level of MLS at that moment to where it was the major story, and he was the major story. So to me, like that transformational piece makes him the athlete of the year not to mention he's an international superstar so you know i think that level kind of puts him in a stratosphere that's pretty hard to touch that's fair uh, you and i are go are on a similar path you're actually on a collision course here for me it's uh early home mm. so in terms of my criteria you want a winner you want a dominant force and there was nobody more dominant in the Premier League than Erling Holland this year. Fastest ever in the Premier League just to get to 50 goals. But that's impressive. To tap 36 in the Premier League and then another another 12 in you have in the Champions League, right? Which is the top of the top in terms of competition. Like that is a major feather in the cap of Erling Holland, and frankly, you know, he he should have been a more serious contender for the Ballon d'Or. Mm. Right? I, I I really think more people need to take a closer look at the individual season that Erling Holland had in comparison to the bigger overarching stories that were connected with Lionel Messi. And, you know, I understand like the, the narrative of it all is important, but in terms of sheer dominance, it is absolutely early on. But one man does not a team make. Now, let's start thinking about this one. Who was your team of the year? Rita, we're going to go to you first. Who is your team of the year and what's your criteria? What were you looking at to determine the team of the year? So your one man does not a team make, nor does one woman a team make. <laughs> so yes. my criteria for the team um, is that they're durable. They can get it together when they're needed, when it's needed, um, and that they have depth and are not just relying on like one or two people to carry them through, um, thus getting them through like injuries and stuff like that. So uh, the team that I picked was the Selección Española de Fútbol, um, specifically the women. So the women's um, World Cup champion team from Spain. Um, they won their first World Cup. They had a 5-1-0 and record, scored 18 goals, conceded seven, um, had a crew of very experienced players, a two-time Ballon d'Or winner, um, just a very deep squad, 
Um, so on the field, they won, they beat England one to nothing, but then also had to deal with the adversity both before, during, and after with um, the way they were treated by their coach and the federation and the incident that happened during the award ceremony. And they came together both on and off the field to deal with that and to get the coach ousted and to create like a better situation for themselves. So um, for all of those reasons, that is my team of the year. I stand corrected. Not just one man, but one woman. And one woman coming to get, women coming together can move mountains. 100% right on that. All right, Dee, what do you think? Who is your team of the year and what is your criteria? Yeah, so uh, my team of the year is the Denver Nuggets. And it's not just because they won me $2,000 in the NBA Finals. Um, <laughs> you know, I just think that to be team of the year, you've got to overcome the odds, come from behind, keep a lead, play together. And there are many times during the season where they were up against better teams and they just, you know, overcame the odds. And they're and they're in Jokic, you know, their their leader, their best player, their finals MVP, their league MVP, in, in my opinion. He delivered and he constantly delivers. And he it's not all about him either. He shares the basketball with everybody in their team. They've got a couple of journeymen too. Aaron Gordon's been around. Um, they drafted well in getting Murray and Jokic was a late round draft pick. And they just, you know, everyone picks the Lakers and they took care of the Lakers, you know, and it's every, you know, and it's just things like that where it's like, oh, they don't have a, they don't have stars. I mean, yeah, Jokic's a great player, but he's not a, I wouldn't call him a star. And they, they still were able to do it. And, um, you know, in Denver, in Denver too, of all places, you know, it's not, we don't, we don't think about basketball when we think of Denver. We, we immediately think of the Broncos and we might even think of the Rockies before we think of the Nuggets and the Avalanche, of course. So, yeah, I mean, for me that, that they were the team of the year, um, they, uh, they took care of business and taking care of the heat and, um, yeah, that's my team. I mean, they've been on knocking on the doorstep for years, and it's about time that Jamal Murray and Jokic ascended to that and filled the potential that they've had. And you know, mm-hmm. it's a budding dynasty. It's definitely a budding dynasty as long as they keep those guys together. For me, tied in with my athlete of the year, I'm going to put Manchester City as the team of the year. Right? I'm seeing a common that. theme with you. <laughs> well, <laughs> you you want to talk about dominance, right? Let's talk about dominance. Predictability, I think. <laughs> I'm sorry. When was the last team that won the trouble? Exactly. Exactly. So, so that run of dominance in a statistical year, in a season, is on is unmatched in recent history. Like you look at the depth of talent they have beyond Holland. You take Holland out. You have Julian Alvarez. You have Jack Grealish. You have Rodri, who scored the game winner in the Champions League. You had Gundogan. Gundogan is not there anymore, but he was there on that team. You have a guy like Kyle Walker, John Stones. They are deep. And that depth is now being tested this season. But in that moment in time, they had multiple players at every position. And they were able to dominate and throttle the competition. Right? They... They were in it up until the end with Arsenal. Arsenal fell back, and then Man City was able to take it. 28-5-5, 89 points. Like, that's in the Premier League. That's pretty darn good. And, you know, virtually unbeatable at the Etihad. Right? One draw, one loss. 17-1-1. Right? That's, That's home field advantage right there. Right? You want to talk about, you know... You want to talk about Minute Maid Park for the Astros, or you want to talk about Fenway Park for the Red Sox. You go to the Etihad, you're going to lose for the most part. And then they took that show on the road. They beat Man U in the FA Cup, right? They won the Champions League. They just won the Team World Cup. So this run is by far 
the most impressive just from the level that they've had to compete at because they're getting the best shot right like you want you, you want to talk about like to be the man you got to beat the man and they were getting everybody's best shot from week one and they pretty much handled everybody, dispatched them pretty easily. So I gotta say that 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 is a major league victory, right? And that's definitely something that is historic. So that definitely qualifies for me for a team of the year. But uh, Clinton, what are, what do you think? What's uh what's your criteria? Who is your winner? Um, so criteria is similar. Um, I. I... I think like you all touched on has to bounce back from adversity um, has to have the depth to handle injuries. Um, and also, you know, they gotta, they gotta win. Uh, the results are gotta be there. So um, it, it may be, I, I tried to avoid the recency bias thing. And I think I'm going against recency bias because many people would say, well, how can they be the team of the year given how they're playing recently? Uh, but it's the Kansas city chiefs. They're mm. Super Bowl champs. Um, they had to deal with a lot of adversity last year. Two major storylines were Mahomes' ankle um, and how he played through those th- that pain. Uh, and secondly, they lost the best receiver in football uh, <laughs> and still won the Super Bowl. So, you know, like to me, yes, right now they're definitely feeling their pains. Uh, I blame more Taylor Swift than anything. Um, <laughs> you know, but if they make the playoffs, oh, it's no. not a team that you really want to see because you know they have the experience. They've been down this road before. They've dealt with diversity. They went in one big playoff games. Um, they've shut up mayors like the mayor. <laughs> so, like, it, it's – to me, they're the team of the year. Uh, wow. Even though they are not in six right now, they're still a story. Um, they're still – kind of that team in the wings that if you catch them on the bad day uh, and Mahomes is is firing even though he may not have the best crew right now um, you know Kadarius Tony certainly has cost them some games <laughs> it, it it will definitely Andy Reid I, I also think like team of the year criteria is your coaching um, and I think I trust Andy Reid to get it figured out. I trust Patrick Mahomes to figure it out. Um, and plus, their defense is even better this year than they were last year when they won the Super Bowl. So, you know, that will be a factor uh, going on the road because they'll have to go on the road and win. Um, they'll have to contain Lamar. I think they're one of the defenses that could do that in the AFC and, and be the representative in the Super Bowl again. Um, but they, they really got to turn it on offensively. But Right now, to be the champ, you got to beat the champ, and they're the champs. Kadarius Tony giveth, and Kadarius Tony take it away. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so that's the thing. But the, the drops are a major problem, you know? And, like, that's the thing. Like, that's something, if they want to get back to where they need to be, they need to figure out how to catch the damn ball. Yeah. Uh, we, and, have, we have had players like that on our team where you they're such an explosive playmaker. So, like, that punt return in the Super Bowl last year set up, you know, the game-winning touchdown pretty much. He can give you that spark, but he will also make the bonehead play that will ruin a game. Um, and that's just the nature of what Kadarius Tony is. No, completely. And, you know, you did touch on the coaching thing, like losing the enemy, having that. Yeah, enemy, yeah. Right? I was about to say, I think that's a big factor with them mm-hmm. because, you know, Eric's an aggressive guy and he'll get in your face and he holds people accountable. I don't know how much Matt Nagy is holding people accountable. Um, I mean, Patrick Mahomes is having meltdowns on the sideline. Like yeah. Travis Kelsey's chucking his helmet. Yeah, it's a bad so, look for them. And you know what? I was, you know, I was talking to somebody about it. It's like their body language is off. The mm-hmm. vibe is off. <laughs> I'm not gonna blame Taylor because she could really trash this show. But uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. I think, I think, uh, and I think Kelsey's having a, a down year. Yes. Um, and that's affecting it. But yeah, they did also lose the most explosive wide receiver in the game. He changes things. And it's like, you know, you would, you know, you could, you could count on, you could count on Pat Mahomes to get them back in the games. But at the end of the day, these guys don't catch the ball. There's, there's nothing you could do. And, you know, I also think they missed, they missed in the draft. 
I think last year they had a better draft and those guys came in and they really made an impact right away and yeah. it was something that everybody wasn't expecting. Like Pacheco. Like, yeah. yeah, like nobody nobody yeah, nobody expected Pacheco to be like running from Rutgers, like running people over and scoring like, you know, ten touchdowns. Like nobody expected that. And on the defensive side of the ball, their corners and their linebackers and they they just were playing at a high level and this year they're kind of meh, you know? And I think uh, I think what they really need is they need to face Buffalo like in the first round of the playoffs and beat Buffalo, and that would really propel them, I think, to you know being making an impact this 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 year. That would certainly help them rewrite their story. But this year has been filled with a lot of stories, right? A lot of big time drama and big time controversy so we need to narrow it down so what's the story of the year i'll go first i think that a major story started the very beginning of the year (laughs) demar hamlin yeah that's that was in millions of people watched a guy die on national television not knowing what was going on We watched this man be worked on and revived in real time. We watched a tragedy unfold in our, in our very, in our very moment, right? In the very moment of our existence. We not only saw that tragedy, but we saw the reversal of such. We saw intervention and we saw his life saved, right? That's, that that moment was bigger than football in in that moment in time everybody there and everybody watching was focused and united on one thing and that was the health and well-being of damar hamlin and i mean you, you have to figure you have to say that it really set the negative tone for 2023 you know seeing that and at the same time, there was also an element of hope, you know, that that things could turn around and things could be saved. So it's an inspirational story as much as it was a potential tragic story. And as much as we would possibly want and as much as DeMar Hamlin would probably want to play more, I understand why he's not. I understand why the Bills are kind of holding him out. But, you know, it's a kudos to the medical staff of the Buffalo Bills is kudos to the staff of Cincinnati uh, Cincinnati General I believe was the hospital that they took him to and you know that trauma that group trauma that we all experienced as viewers as players as coaches as DeMar Hamlin himself like that was a that was horrific but at the same time inspirational too but I also think that was really uh it's the power of prayer, man. I really, truly believe that man is alive today because he had so many people praying for him. I mean, me included. I mean, I totally did not want his life to end that day. And I really believe every football fan in America was was kind of going to bat for him there. And and it worked. And yeah, he doesn't play much now, but I think he's I think he's takes some gratitude that he's still alive. Um, I would think so. I would hope I think so. so. Just a little yeah. bit. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think he's proud of his team running the ball two weeks ago. But yeah, I, that was that was definitely. I, I watched it happen live. I couldn't believe what I was watching. Oh, absolutely! And it was just an, an amazing way to start the year, and it was an amazing moment, both positive and negative. But you're right. The power. The the power of power of prayer. Po- the power of positive intention right even if you don't believe in a divine being the power of positive intention really brought that through but uh d what was yours what was your story well of the year? you know what to be honest with you i think i think my story is taking place right now um it's it's just developing but how about the detroit pistons losing 20 straight mm. 27 straight games yeah. how the hell is that possible how is it possible that a professional basketball team hasn't won a, hasn't won a game in three months that's wild and you know what i don't see any wins coming they're facing the celtics tomorrow that ain't gonna happen then they're gonna play toronto 
the Rockets are good, the Jazz, the Warriors, the Nuggets again. Like, I don't see. You know what? They have a chance on January 10th. They're playing the Spurs, who are almost as bad as they are. <laughs> and that might be their next opportunity. I mean, I'm pretty sure that you you you, you can't you can't just get somebody on their worst day you can't even beat a bit you know you you know some everybody has a bad day right it's pot is it pot, you can't you can't run up against one of these teams they're just having a bad day i mean it's not even close i mean they're even losing to the bad teams yeah, I mean, they invested 77 million dollars in their coach and he's yeah out, he's, he's the highest paid play. coach in the league <laughs> and he's drawing a place for alec burks for the game winning shot when let's have do team. it Cade cunningham is feeding alec burks Kate game, Cunningham is doing the best he can do, and it's not enough. He scored like 40 points in the second half a couple of days ago. It wasn't enough. You know what's funny? That is every team now, it, you know, like when you're the top of the team, you're going to get their A game. You're mm-hmm. They're going to get their A game from the opponent because nobody wants to be the opponent that they win against. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh my god! Now, you know he just signed this contract, but how <laughs> long before you like? How long before you blame the coach on this one? I mean, my goodness! Or you, I mean, you break up this team, but I mean, really, what are you gonna? I would up? just let him. I would just <laughs> let him. I would just let him fry. Like I'm not. I'm do. not bringing in anybody else to deal with this shit. No way. I mean, you can't. Like, there's yeah. really nothing you can do. Like, the, the players are lowering their value. Monty Williams is lowering his value. And you know, like the fans are just like, what the fuck do you want from me? Just think about the players. Like after the twenty, after they lost twenty in a row, you kind of like, all right, we're we're gonna win, right? Like we're gonna win like tomorrow. Like it's coming. And then you get to the twenty-seven, you gotta start to think, when is this ever gonna? And you know, when they win, it's gonna be like a huge celebration. And they're gonna, and then they're gonna lose five more. They're gonna go on to lose five five game losing streak right after that. Well, I mean, the only thing you gotta think of is that they'll catch a team that's like load managing. They, but and that's then, actually happened to them. They've, they've, they've <laughs> faced teams on back-to-backs where the team was resting all their players. They still lost. You brought out these G League guys, and they still won. Oh, my goodness gracious. Oh, the, the, it's bad. It's just bad. All right, so, Rita, what, do you, what is your story of the year? So, um, Clinton kind of, like, kind of gave a teaser for this one um so my story of the year is uh messy to mls which happened in june um for kind of a variety of reasons um for mls itself um attendance was up past 10 million people mls store like surpassed their revenue by august for the year um, engagement on socials. Um, and the thing about MLS is like everybody says like, oh, it's a retirement league and, you know, it's for kind of second class players. But that's the league. Like that's the league that I take my kids to. That It's like the people's league. Like you go there, you see regular families, kids, um, people who just want to watch soccer. So we now have like this generational talent you know eight time Ballon d'Or winner and we can go see him um so and the thing was too he came to a team that was not very good that finished second to last in the Eastern Conference and it didn't matter they were still like like everyone was there and it's like Clinton was saying like everybody all the kids have the messy kids this like pink salmon nightmare everybody's wearing them they can, they're flying off the shelves they can't like make them fast enough um and all of this for a 36 year old body that is like you know being held together with duct tape but he's there he's showing up he's playing he is amazing and we have all of these of soccer events coming up in the next few years copa america gold cup world cup women's world cup olympics that are all going to be in north america and it's kind of like here you go like it's it's finally here and people are finally like latching on to this so um that is my story of the year with Lionel messi coming to miami i mean it's hard to argue i mean you just see the eyes on the the league you see the influx of revenue and then the ticket prices 
You know, you see the ticket prices going through the roof for Inter Miami games. So it's, you know, this is big time. It's definitely big time. And he is definitely further legitimizing the league. You know, <laughs> there's, there's that idea, like you were saying, Rita, that it's a, you know, it's a retirement league because you had David Villa and Beckham and all these guys come in at the tail ends of their careers. But he's coming and he's still bringing it. He just won the Ballon d'Or. So, you know, with any luck, he keeps bringing it this year with his new buddy, his new running mate, Luis Suarez. And um, hopefully the crowd still turn out. So, Clinton, coming back to you since Rita invoked your name, what is your story of the year? Um, I think my story of the year is kind of a multitude of situations, and that is the backup quarterback. Um, Yeah. The NFL has been ravaged, even though they have put in many rules uh, and they are over calling roughing the passer. In my opinion, Uh, it doesn't matter. They have lost some superstars. I mean, you all know I'm a jet fan. So it starts with heartbreak after four plays and crushing (laughs) the souls of the jets uh, with Aaron Rodgers going down uh, and not having a legitimate backup. Joe Burrow, uh, you know, breaking his wrist, I believe. And then all of a sudden, then it just keeps going, right? So Anthony Richardson's out, Justin Herbert's out, Daniel Jones is out. Um, and, you know, like an attachment to that as the story of the year happens to be the DeVito kid, right? Like the the Sean Stellato is a Marist grad. I remember going to Marist basketball games. He was also on the Marist basketball team. People forget this. He was a receiver for the Marist College Red Foxes, but he was also on the basketball team and he rode the bench. He never played. Uh, and we used to chant, we want Stilato when it was blowout. Uh, Sounds about right. He would come in and just chuck up the ball because uh, we wanted him to score so badly. Uh, but, you know, now I just saw today that Tommy DeVito is being sponsored by Rouse homemade pasta sauce. So, like, it, it is incredible what a, a backup role could do. I mean, look at what Gardner Minshew's doing. Uh, look at what Mason Rudolph did the other day for the Steelers. You know, on, on, on Christmas weekend, Rudolph is performing. So, like, the idea of these backup quarterbacks is the story of the NFL this year. Because uh, I think what's going on is there is definitely, you know, I mean, Joe Flacco's going to beat the Jets this week. Like, how ironic is that? Deshaun hey, Watson's hey, hey, name. Trevor Simeon standing <laughs> in his way, okay? Deshaun Watson's <laughs> another name I didn't mention. Like, these quarterbacks are losing their seasons to season injury season end injuries and um you're only as good as your backup these days and i think gms are learning that valuable lesson in a good way or a bad way um you know easton stick trevor simeon you know whatever you're rolling out there and it's just not good it sounds like an underarm deodorant yeah (laughs) (laughs) you know that's my story of the year is uh you better have a good backup because your quarterback is pretty much a sack away from being out. Another honorable mention one is definitely to go along with what you were saying about the backup quarterback is that the NFL versus the running back was another uh, mm-hmm. st- another sub story that was definitely getting a lot of play over the summer. But um, you know that was definitely a feud between the NFL and the perception of what the running back is. But uh, let's dig a little bit deeper as far as feuds of the year. Rita, what is your feud of the year? Okay, so this one, again, like I took this one kind of personally. Um, So I picked Carly Lloyd versus the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team, Um, who I have loved since the first World Cup in 1991. Like, I wanted to be them. And... I grew up watching them. I grew up watching Carly. Her hat trick in the World Cup in 2015 is like one of my top 10 greatest sports memories. And now she's retired. Um, The women were able to get their equal pay for um, representing Team USA. We made like all these strides. And now here she is going out talking about how they're not tough and how they're celebrating too much and all of this. And I feel like, why do we need to tear each other down? 
like analyze the soccer, talk about the game, talk about the formation, and talk about it and make it personal. So um, for me, that's my feud of the year. And I think that that's going to kind of be like ongoing as she, of course, has a lot of followers and attracts a lot of viewers. And I think that like we're going to kind of feed off of this feud for a while. So that is my feud for this year. All right, Dee, coming out, yeah, what is your feud of the year? <clears throat> hmm, I think, I think the feud of the year is everything that went down with James Harden and Daryl Morey. Ooh, oh, that's a good one. By far the craziest thing ever. I mean, he called his boss, and this is the, this, he called his boss a liar in front of reporters and, and, TV personalities, and this is the guy who made him one of the highest paid players in Houston. This is the guy who traded for him and, you know, brought him to Philly, paid him again in Philly, and he calls him a liar and refuses to play for him and demands that he gets traded to the team that he wants to be traded to. I mean, Daryl Morey could have kept this thing going on and on and on forever to the point where he... He told him not to get on the team charter to go back to the practice facility and practice because he had missed practice the whole week. I mean, James continues to play mediocre and demand trades. And really, he's gotten what he's wanted every time. And it set a very poor precedent for future stars who are unhappy with their situation because I think everybody feels like they could just not play, be a problem, and you'll get eventually what you want. Yeah, um, that, that seems to be the issue throughout. But yeah, never a good look calling your boss a liar. A- and anyway. not many people could call their boss a liar and keep their job. Mm-hmm. He actually kept it for like another month, and then they and then they finally moved him. Yeah, it was like that scene in Little Big League. As soon as we'll find somebody dumb enough to take it, it's exactly what we're gonna do. <laughs> so Clinton, you're up. What is your feud of the year? I think my feud of the year happens to be between Noah Lyles and the NBA. Um, mm-hmm. He is, of course, is American sprinter um, and has a big Olympics coming up and is, you know, destined to probably be a competitor in the 100 meter, uh, could be the fastest man in, in the world. Um, and he decided in his platform after, uh, you know, a championship race to call out the NBA for calling their champions, the Denver Nuggets, the world champions. Um, And it turned out he was right because they go to the FIBA world championships and America finishes fourth, not even second, fourth. Um, And it, 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 you know, obviously definitely vindication for his performance or his words because they couldn't beat the rest of the world in basketball. And here they are, you know, and, and a lot of NBA stars came out against him. Kevin Durant, um, you know, LeBron James talking like, is this guy crazy? Like, we, of course, we're the world champions. We're the best basketball players in the world. So that's why we just take the world moniker when we win the championship and we hold up that trophy. Uh, but he he turned out to be right. So he kind of won that feud, in my opinion. And, you know, good for him and gutsy of him to take on the entire league in that regard and some major influencers like LeBron James and Kevin Durant. And lest we forget that uh, the two best players in there were one's from Eastern Europe and the other one's from Canada. So that's all you need to know about that. So Noah Lyles should definitely feel vindicated about that. But for me, the feud of the year has to be, and this is close because you have have a lot of really interesting subplots. I got to say that the number one feud this year was between Major League Baseball fans and Major League Baseball. Particularly the traditionalists of it all. This year was a major year of change, right? With the new pitch clock and the bigger bases. And there's a lot of change happening. There's a lot happening in Major League Baseball. Plus you have the challenge system and you have so many facets of the game being tinkered with at the same time in order to speed up the game and ultimately have 
a better, faster, more athletic product. And fans aren't exactly, some fans aren't exactly happy about this, right? It's like, get your hands off my damn game. And baseball, in general, is the sport where you have these guardians of the game. Pretty much every other sport welcomes these changes, right? You, I mean, the ABA ushered in the three-point shot in the NBA, and it, I'm sure you had a few people who were against it, but not to the point where Major League Baseball fans are, right? The NHL eliminated the two-line pass, and they instituted the, the no-touch icing, people weren't up in arms about that. So Major League Baseball needs to do these things in order to stay relevant. And these fans need to realize that in order for them to have a product to go see, they're going to have to embrace change. Like they may not have to like it, but they have to understand that this is what's happening. And it's working. I. I as somebody who is skeptical of these changes, it's working. We have to acknowledge that. But Major League Baseball fans, you need to get down off your high horse and you need to acknowledge the fact that the game needs to change. And it was too much. It's too much at one given time. But it needs to happen. So kudos to Rob Manford. There I said it. My one nice thing I've said about him this year. Kudos to him. And Rob Manfred has caught a lot of flack from us on this show. Like He's been the alleged Superstar of the Week nominee multiple times. So he is not our, he's not our favorite commissioner. But, you know, you have to acknowledge when he's doing something right. And we as fans need to embrace it. The Fade Store presents the alleged Superstar of the Week Award. You guys know what time it is. It is time for the alleged superstar of the year. So here's what's going to happen, guys. We each have somebody that we're going to nominate. And it's going to go up on our Twitter account. It's going to put up, we're going to put up that poll at Fade Route DNZ. And you vote. And you vote. And you vote. And you vote. And the winner of this vote will get a shout out on this year's show. And the coveted ass trophy for the entire year. This is the grand trophy. The biggest ass trophy that we can give. Let's see what we come up with. Clinton, who is your alleged superstar of the year? Uh, it has to be Russell Wilson. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, this is definitely recency bias, but I also am going back to last year and just the fact that he said, let's ride, and then had his worst performance, which could be credited to Nate Hackett, because let's face it, I'm not in love with him either. But the idea of going out there, and basically the organization has known for two months that you are not the answer, yet we want you to go out there and win games for us. And then you put on this performance that actually leads the Broncos to relevance, and now they're benching you for Jared Stidham? Because they know by contract, you know, kind of legality, they don't want to pay you the money that you are going to be owed. And they've paid you an an orbit amount of money thus far. Um, And he's getting screamed at by Sean Payton on the sideline. And he's going to be, you know, the good old boy in the media yet again and probably not trash the Broncos organization. Uh, It's Russell Wilson. That is very fair. That's very fair. All you know, all success, recent success aside. Yeah. D, who is your alleged superstar of the year? Oh, I was a little bit worried that uh, Clinton was going to take my guy. <laughs> uh, but my alleged superstar of the year, it's got to be Joe Douglas. I mean, <laughs> the roster moves over his tenure are all head scratchers. The idea that all you need is a Hall of Fame quarterback to lead your team to the promised land 
is not the model every team should follow. Like, I know he hit on Sauce Gardner and he hit on Garrett Wilson, but man, it's hard to find anybody else he's really hit on. Now the Jets are at the mercy of Aaron Rodgers, who will be 40 years old, coming off of an Achilles tear. And he's the only quarterback in the world who can run Hackett system and apparently score touchdowns. So I don't, I don't know if it's the system or if it's the quarterback or what, but the idea that this man still has a job and Robert Sala still has a job and, and Zach Wilson is still on the team is just incredible. Um, and I'm really curious to see how everything plays out next year, especially you see other teams being successful with backup quarterbacks like you know Joe Joe Flacco, Case Keenum, and the list goes on and on. I, I, I mean, the, <laughs> the list goes on and on of backups who have been successful this year. But the Jets, Joe Douglas couldn't get it done. Rita, who is your wedding oh, superstar of the area? Uh, mine is not a human; it is actually a computer, um, and that would be the video assistant referee VAR. Um, my complaint starts with soccer, but also exists in football, which are the sports I watch the most. Um, I feel like it's taking out the human element and basically making the humans, um, it's going to be like toll booth operators soon. Like, it's hard enough being a referee. It's hard enough making these judgment calls. And now everyone immediately is looking to these computers to make the decision. And it's taking away from the integrity of the games. Um, it's adding time to the games. It's stopping games at unnatural points. And even the players, like the players themselves, are looking for flags and looking, looking for, for handballs and looking for calls. And um, I think it's ruining the games. Maybe for the sake of betting, I'm not sure. That's like another conversation. Um, but I am going to say that VAR is my alleged superstar of the year. It's a good choice. It's it's solid. Infected soccer. It's infected football. It's infected baseball. They, it's unchecked instant replay is definitely serving to be a problem. For me, I'm going with Brooklyn Nets. Hmm. They assemble this air quote super team, right? And they tried multiple iterations. Your most recent one, you had James Harden, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving. One absolute ugats with them. And then, just all of a sudden, Kyrie's like, I don't want to play here anymore, trade me. And that was the beginning of the end. He's gone. Then... Harden's gone. And Durant is gone. And now you're sitting at 15 and 15, fourth in the Atlantic, wondering what the hell happened to my life. We were set up. This was supposed to be this big thing. We were supposed to have this super team that was going to win. Not three, not four, not five. This sound familiar? The only difference is that LeBron delivered. Not three, not four, not five, but he at least delivered one. Like, what did you get out of this? Outside of drama and bullshit and Ben Simmons. Great. Great. Brooklyn Nets, you are my alleged superstar of the year. I think we've set our piece. Go to our X account at DNZ and vote. And vote and vote and vote. And for our nominees, just do better, folks. Just do better in 2024.
favorite podcast has its own merch line now. Go to the Fade Store with DNZ.com today for all your Fade Route merch needs. I'm talking tank tops, t-shirts, sweatshirts, like yoga pants, we got those too. Like some cool accessories, we got those too. And we're not done yet. We have so much more planned for you, but check out what we have today at the Fade Store with DNZ.com. That's the Fade Store with DNZ.com. Welcome back to our special in route roundtable, end of year 2023. But let's put 2023 in the rear view mirror where it belongs and let's start talking about 2024. What is one bold sports prediction for next year? D, we'll start with you. What is your bold sports prediction for next year? Here's my bold sports prediction. The Cleveland Browns will play in the AFC Championship game. How about that? That is bold. That is bold. Take that, Joe Douglas. (laughs) That's a bold one. That's absolutely bold. Rita, what is your bold prediction for next year? Um, a New York team will win something significant for the first Ooh. time since 2011. Oh, okay. MLS Cup doesn't count. Yeah, I was about to say that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't count they that? Already, they, they did their job. My beloved New York City Football Club, who I'll talk about later. Um, but we need Yankees, Giants, Knicks, Jets. Like, they're the ten in the top ten most valuable teams win something rangers baby there we go there we go clinton what is your bold sports prediction for next year i uh, i mean damien probably sees this coming but i'm telling you right now the jets hold the record for all major sports organizations for the longest playoff drought in the history yes. in 13 yes. years they break it. next year they make the playoffs by the skin of their teeth i'm not saying it's they're in winning the AFC East, but they will make the playoffs and be bounced in the first round. I feel like I've heard this before. <laughs> it sounds familiar. There's something familiar about this. Is that with Aaron Rodgers under center? Or God, I hope so. Oh, for fuck's sake. Joe Douglas. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> He's brainwashed you too. <laughs> Got you talking about next year. <laughs> Oh my God! He's drinking his green Kool Aid. I'm trying. Uh, You gotta, you know what? Sometimes you gotta, you you gotta drink the whole thing. You gotta have hope. You know, you you do, you do. Absolutely. For me, my bold sports prediction is that the New York Knicks will trade for their superstar. It will finally happen, and this is the guy who will actually stick. And this is the guy who will actually deliver them deep into the playoffs. The last guy, the last supposed guy, the last alleged superstar that they got didn't deliver the goods. This one will. Mm. Is that Donovan Mitchell? Is that somebody else? I don't know. But it will be a superstar caliber player, and he will be here for the New York Knickerbockers. And since we're thinking about 2024 and it's only in a few days it's only natural that we start thinking about new year's resolutions you know what what can we stop doing what can we start doing what can we do better let's think about that for our sports teams so what would your new year's resolutions be for your teams clinton we'll start with you uh mine's an easy one stop hiring coaches who were made famous by Hall of Fame players. They need to start hiring coaches who made players into Hall of Fame players. So they relied on Adam Gase, whose only good year was with Peyton Manning. (laughs) And they relied on Nate Hackett, whose only good year, and like Damian said before, the only human in the world that could run his offense and actually make it look good is Aaron Rodgers. Um, there's a reason that these men were hired and that's because they had Hall of Fame quarterbacks. For once, we will do the Mike McDaniel move 
but once we will do something along the Kyle Shanahan move where they make quarterbacks like Brock Purdy or even a Tua into superstars because they know how to coach. God, how please many, let that be the resolution. But how many quarterbacks have Shanahan and McDaniel gotten killed recently? <laughs> you, got, you want to make an omelet, you got to break a few eggs, apparently. That's that, Hey, whatever works. We, we've we tried four, and it doesn't seem to work. That's fair. That is fair. Rita, what is your New Year's resolution for your team? I'm sorry. I was just getting over what you just said about Kai Shanahan. Um, okay, so for my resolution, I would like a striker to NYCFC, my beloved. I would like a new giant O-line in any variety, like because it does not matter who is the quarterback if they're going to get sacked 12 times a game. I would like two Yankee starters, uh, starting pitchers, who are not named Garrett Cole, in addition to Garrett Cole. And I also would like Mr. Hackett to not be the offensive coordinator of the New York Jets. It's a, tall it's a big, yeah. it's a tall order. That's a tall one, man. <laughs> That's a tough one. He might be a tall guy eventually. If they don't get off to a good start. Eventually. Eventually. I can't wait to see what their first five games are next year. <laughs> that train's not late. I cannot wait to see what they are. Oh my god. I'm. It's prediction is pain. Pain. But for my teams, I'll start with the Mets. Pick a direction. Rebuild or load up with superstars. Doing both at the same time never works. Pick a clear direction and run with it. That's why you brought in David Stern, right? This is the do more with less guy. Sounds like a Met already. <laughs> so pick a direction, stick with it. If you're going to invest in the guys that are here, invest in them. Lock up, Mc, uh, lock up McNeil. Lock up Alonzo. You're already locked up Nimmo. Maybe Francisco Alvarez is amenable to a, a, an extension. Right? Give it a go. If these are your guys, then make them your guys. But stick to a direction and commit to something. That's what I wish. That's what I hope for the Mets this year to piggyback off of what Rita said about the Giants. I want a quarterback. I don't want some bullshit Mickey Mouse quarterback who played at Duke. I don't want an undrafted free agent who just parlayed this into a deal for Jarred Sauce. <laughs> and whose agent it's was It's a homemade Jarred Sauce, damn it. <laughs> whose agent was extorting pizzerias. <laughs> It's like the Sopranos, man. Like it's, it's literally it's legit the Sopranos. Right? I mean, they're starting to Rod Taylor for the rest of the year. Okay, he's at least capable. I want more than capable. For God's sake, can I have more than fucking capable? Right? Give me something good. Good. And now Russ is gonna be available, and obviously, like Russ is gonna be like the guy who's gonna be the on the high the you know the, the top of the list, maybe. Maybe Jimmy G's available. I don't know. But give me something oh, better than God. capable. <laughs> no, not Jimmy G. Oh my God. Somebody better than capable. Hey, Tyrod like, is a Super Bowl champion. Just want to throw that out there, man. Yes, as a backup for Joe Flacco. Well, I think he was ACC Player of the Year one time too. <laughs> oh, ACC football. Oh, oh, oh my God, ACC football. <laughs> Jesus Christ, is that what we're doing? Tommy DeVito played in the ACC. Oh, Jesus Christ Almighty. For the Rangers, finish the job. We've been knocking on the door for years. You're exceeding expectations right now with Peter Laviolette. Finish the damn job. 94 is 30 years ago. Finish the job, please. And last but not least, NYCFC. I agree we need a striker. We also need a competent head coach. And I am, I for one, am making a public call to Maxime Cheneau. Come home. Come home and coach this team. They miss you desperately. We need you, coach. But it's time for us to run the go route. 
Thank Hold you on, I gotta do my, me. I gotta do my oh, team. Oh, yes, you do. Yes, you do. So, yeah, so for me, it's really just for one, it's the Ra- it's the Ravens. Uh, after slapping the 49ers, I would say to them, just just don't lose pathetically in the playoffs this year. That's, that's pretty much my whole thing. It's, we're going to lose, at least let it be a tight game where we, we're competent and we don't throw the ball on the ground and things like that. So, yeah, let's, let's finish strong. <clears throat> Nothing for the Braves? No, no, they'll mess it up all on their own. <laughs> there's, there's no uh, resolution that's gonna help that team. Uh, we gotta, uh, we gotta figure out how to beat the Dodgers in f- probably five games. Just wait for them to wait for them to implode. It's gonna happen. It's. It, I think everybody here is in agreement that that's gonna happen. So we're we're just waiting for that train to arrive. But. Let's kiss 2023 goodbye. Let's ring in 2024 in a major way, in a positive way. And we wish you nothing but a happy new year. And it's time for us to run the go route for real this time. We'll talk to you soon. Peace, love, happy new year, everybody. Thanks for listening to this episode of our podcast. If you like what you heard and want to hear more, be sure to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Rate us five stars. Leave us a review. Turn on subscription notifications and tell your friends. Spread the word. Spread it wide.